How are you guys doing? You know, at the college where I teach, the October break has started. So, all my students are home. While you guys are stuck in a hall with some stranger talking to you, I feel your pain. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or not. <laughs> I'm really great, grateful for the invitation to speak here. You know, you get to old and forget things, so I'm sure Jeffrey DeLeo doesn't remember that I he was a contributor to a book I edited 20 years ago. Same? <laughs> same, same person? <laughs> Class issues, man. All right. <laughs> You'll be punished for that. <laughs> Definitely giving you a D this semester. <laughs> So listen, um, I was asking our man Jeff, um, but you know what, who, who am I going to be speaking to? And he said, there'll be folks, friends from the community, there'll be some faculty members, but primarily just students who have been, you know, forced to attend your talk. <laughs> and so I have a few questions for you because I aim to please, all right? How many of you are in a writing class? Like a composition, okay, you know, as a teacher. How many of you are either immigrants or the children of immigrants? All right. Excellent. I ask because my most recent book is called Immigrant Montana. And I just want to tell you a little bit about how books come to be or uh, how even you choose your title. So is that is that something I can do in the beginning, you think? So, <clears throat> and, and then I'll read a little bit. In fact, let me just keep the time. Because, you know, after a while, when your students start looking at the time, you know that you're up here, so I don't know. Oh, it's the bell, right? Yeah. Uh, all right, good, good, good. So listen, what happened was, <clears throat> I wasn't born in this country, and I came here, and I was a student. And one day, listening to the radio, I heard someone say that a wolf had been killed in immigrant Montana. Just because that person said, hmm, I'm going to read that part. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Why don't what happened was, I mean, you know, in the same way as I asked how many of you are in a writing class, let me ask you something else, which is, which is, how many of you, how many of you have written love poems? No one is going to. <laughs> I, I often think, that is certainly it happened in my case, that when I was young and didn't have anything really to write about, the moment I thought I was in love, I suddenly had something to write about. You know what I'm saying? And the economics, and the economics pro, you know, teacher at school was talking about, I don't know, butter and guns or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I was writing a poem about the girl I liked, you know, who's just the outline of his jaw was visible to me from the place where I was sitting in the classroom. You know what I'm saying? Not that I could write a poem. I think, I think what often inhibits us as writers is that we do not often have a need to write anything. We don't know what to write about. And I think the discovery of a subject is the first step to being a writer. And I think for me, immigration was a great gift because suddenly I had a subject to write. In the beginning, I have to say, it was not simply the idea of having come to a new place and therefore reporting on what was new, which also I read about after I have found the page about immigrant one time. Um, but it was also actually anger or rage. So there are three things marked out. First, let me read out, read out a little bit about immigrant one time. Immigrant Montana. 
Those were the words I suddenly heard on the radio, the name of a place. Leon, uh, NPR's Leon Hansen said that federal officers had killed a wolf at a ranch near immigrant Montana. I was instantly back in Yellowstone with Nina, listening to tapes as we drove through the forest, a mock fear of bears when she took off her clothes and the wolves. That morning in the motel, they were only half an hour north of us. Wolf number three, Hansen said, with a slight smack of her lips, had developed a taste for sheep. A man from the National Park Service said that number three had killed at least one sheep, maybe three, and then he was moved 60 air miles away, but he came back and another sheep was attacked. Three made a mistake, we gave him a second chance, he made a second mistake, we removed him from the population. I felt like laughing. In the quietness of my apartment, I heard this man trying to sound like Harvey Keitel. I realized I was doing what Nina always did, talking back to the radio. This is NPR. When did you hire Quentin Tarantino? <laughs> I yearned for Nina. Now I felt I understood why she listened to the radio. It was as if she was walking alone down a crowded street and the world reached her in the form of scraps of conversation and shouts. I wanted my voice in a year. It was my father's birthday. He was now 65, and his weak heart was killing him. He would not live long. So I told myself that on this special day, the least I could do was love my girlfriend. If Nina were around, or even if she would simply call me that day, I'd say to her, I love you. I wanted to see her laughing when she heard me say that I liked wolf number three and his preference for unbrainy sheep over vixen. I have this image of the wolf running through 60 miles of undergrowth across frozen lakes he had never seen before, never pausing because his eyes were hungry for home, for the sight of the familiar fence and the sheep ranged inside. Honey, I hope you got to pull one down by the throat, the sheep's head thrown back and the blood warm near his mouth before some stupid, solemn jerk with a hard on nailed him with a $3,000 rifle. All right, I want to say to you in this era of fake news that immigrant news as a title is hashtag fake news because the real name of that place was Emigrant Montana. But if you're an immigrant, you hear Immigrant Montana. It took me many years actually. This must have been you know, somewhere in the mid 90s when I heard this on the radio. It took me many years before I realized my mistake. And that happened when an Indian newspaper editor called me and said, you know, Barack Obama was going to receive his, uh, accept the nomination uh, for uh, the Democratic candidate in, uh, at the convention that was going to be held in Denver. And when these people called me, I said, yes, I'll go there, because I'd heard this name, and I knew it was in Montana, and even with my poor sense of geography, I knew Montana was somewhere in relation to Colorado. I said, yes, yes. And then I hired and went there. The name of the place is actually Emigrant Montana, but you know, I just, I took some liberties with it and made it Emigrant Montana because it seemed like the mistake, the misreading on my part, as well as the investment, the affect, both were important in describing how immigrants construct their realities and then tell stories about themselves. Does that make sense to you? All right, so that was my first thing that I wanted to say about immigrant Montana. But then I wanted to tell you about the discovery of the subject, all right? Um, in the sense of, you have to, why I said that immigration was a great gift to me, because it gave me a subject, all right? So I'll read a little section about my narrator, which also applies to me. So here's a conversation that happens between the narrator and his parents. It's a phone call. Phone calls at that time were very expensive in the 90s across the continent, across the um, ocean. Why have you not written no word for so many days? I have, I said to my mother. I did, just last night. Is it very cold there? No, no, I went to an apple orchard yesterday. We took a rickshaw and came here to call you because I woke up from a dream. She wouldn't tell me what she had seen in her dream, and so I told her that the only reason I hadn't written was my classes. 
Do you guys make that excuse when you're parents or something? Never? <laughs> no? It's much e believe me, it's so much easier for you guys. You can just text. And you know, and I've, I've noticed from what my daughter texts me that you don't even have to be grammatical. You just start to <laughs> misspell words. So you can just text and say, I'm all right, you know, or something like that. In my time, ma'am, we'd have to write letters. We could go and buy, you know, and then write or post them, stamps, all kinds of things. Life is much easier for you guys. Anyway, um, <laughs> but the thing I was telling you about why immigration was a gift was that you're split from one place, and therefore you're noticing differences. In the same way as you, with your iPhones in your hand, go to another city, and if you have an Instagram account, you suddenly see new things. Or you have more to report, because you're seeing with an outsider's eye. You know what I'm saying? What, what, the same path that you walk every day is familiar to you. To become a writer, you have to become the outsider. You have to see as if you are an outsider what you've been seeing every day. Or you put, take yourself to a different path, right? Be curious. Simple exercise. The other day I asked my kids, my students to write about, because they had read George Orwell's embarrassment of killing and shooting an elephant, I asked them to write about something that they're embarrassing. Because you know, the academy trains us only to be either authoritative, you know, just seem to know something, or it trains us to be like as if you were writing a, you know, like in the essay you wrote to get into this college. You couldn't write, I'm in a failure in everything I've done. <laughs> Which, if I was applying at your age, would have been a real honest statement. <laughs> I mean, I know the president of the college is here, so I shouldn't use such language, but it would have been just made sense if I had said, I'm a total fucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that were, that's what it was. But I, if I was on that committee, I would say, okay, this person is honest. <laughs> I think we should admit this person. They have something to achieve now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> so I asked them, can you write something that you're embarrassed about? And I was struck by how some kids really, really reached for that, you know? They wanted to be honest about something that had stayed with them. That hurt them to this day because they had made a mistake or they had said something hurtful. While some others were like, you know, skimming the surface. Mm -hmm. I took away my seven-year-old sibling's toy one day and she cried. <laughs> Is that the worst you can do? <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah, that's one thing to do, you know, being honest. Uh, so in this, in this, the idea of the outsider, in these letters is coming across, and I just want to read a few lines to you, and I think that's also part of how writing should go. My grandmother, okay, uh, um, send, her, send her a postcard too. They were going to visit my grandmother in the village for Diwali. Send her a postcard too, my mother said. We don't need to write anything much. Just write Mataji I'm well. Just four words and she'll be happy. My grandmother couldn't read or write. She would have asked someone in the village, perhaps a kid walking back from school, to read my letter aloud to her. Or my cousins, Deepak and Sunita, if they weren't stealing anything at that time from her garden or her granddad. About once a month, I sent my grandmother a postcard. I would sit down to write and then imagine a school-going child reading out my words. To bring to the young student a sense of wonder, I would add a line of <coughs> about life in America. When it is, so this is a few of the lines, and I want you to see them as simple lines, the lines of an outsider. When it is midnight in India, it is middle of the day here. And I'm reporting from my own life. I imagined, you know, my cousin would have been, oh, I don't know, 12, 10, at that time in the village, reading my letter out to my grandmother. So I guess I'm saying to imagine that other person who is your reader, not always necessarily your instructor, because then that is a rather dull audience member to have in mind. 
You know what I'm saying? Also, if every, like, like let's say this was my class, and everyone had the same instructor in mind. Let's say this wonderful man who's been smiling through us. <laughs> if everyone had the same instructor in mind, everyone would do almost the same kind of writing. You don't understand what I'm saying? But if everyone had a different, distinct individual in mind, your writing would also be addressed to different places. It would be almost as if we were putting letters in the mailbox headed to different directions. And therefore, there is an immense variety there. And one should be attentive to that. Anyway, even the people who collect garbage have their own truck. You cannot travel in a train without a ticket. To go from one part of the city to another, I use the train that runs underground. When I cook, a supply of gas is just like water. It is delivered through a pipe connected to my stove. No standing in long lines for gas cylinders. Cool. So that was just a little report on the difference. But the other thing that immigration gave to me was actually anger. Because I would go to collect my visa, you know, first as an MA student and then as a PhD student to the embassy in New Delhi. And I guess have been from a fairly well-to-do family, educated family, I hadn't necessarily encountered ritual humiliation before. But these would be humiliating experiences, one after the other, each time. And that got under my skin. And every time I would answer the question in the way I was asked, politely, but in my mind I was already writing a book, you know what I mean? My first book is called Passport Photos because it is written as a passport. You know, the passport, if you open a passport, it says name, place of birth, date of, date of birth, nation, identifying marks. It doesn't say language, but that's also another thing. So the whole book is just made about these. These are the chapters, cool? Which are meditations on that. Everything I could not say to the officer. Hmm. Not the answer demanded by the state, but the answer produced by the subject under interrogation. So, I'm going to, after the dean said that these were students who were, I thought, okay, let me, let me, so I used the college resources, Mr. President, to print out <laughs> an article that I'll read to you from. So, so I would write, later on, after 9-11, the, the department became the Department of Homeland Security, but when I got my citizen, when I got my visas, it used to be called Immigration and Naturalization Service. So I wrote a cycle of poems that was called Love Poems for the INS. <laughs> I'm going to read you a little section because I wanted to say, sometimes you're reporting or sometimes you're in love, you write, but sometimes you write because you just want, you're angry, you know? You want to speak to the man. You can't trust them. One officer says, I'm prepared to bet he's from Brooklyn. There is no response from the other one. He's not angry, just sad that I now work in his country. This quiet American has pasted a sheet with Hindi alphabets on his left. On his right, there is a proverb from Punjab. You just can't trust them, the first one repeats, shaking his wrist to loosen his heavy watch. The one sitting down now raises his weary eyes. Did you, the first time you went there, intend to come back? Do you understand this question, by the way? So let's say I'm now a PhD student. I've gone, I've taken my sorry passport back there and said, uh, I'm back for a holiday. I now need to go back. I've done two years of graduate work. I need to go back to resume my studies. So they will ask you, do you intend to come back? And at that time, I must confess, I did want to come back. I was quite certain I was, but other things happened. Life gets in the way. Um, I didn't think at that time I was a liar, you know what I'm saying? And so they ask you, do you intend to come back? Stuff like that. Anyway, so. The one sitting down now raises his weary eyes. Did you, the first time you went there, intend to come back? Wait a minute, I say. Did you? Get a visa when you first went to the moon. Fuck the moon. Tell me about Vietnam. 
Just how precise were your plans there, you asked? Oh. Cool. So, that is youthful anger, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm mellow and wise. <laughs> <laughs> so, talking about wisdom, how are you guys doing? You leaving? You guys leaving now? <laughs> I was like, too many four letter words. We are gone, and we are Texans, we are polite here. All right, I've spoken about, we are halfway through the presentation. So now I want to give you evidence of my, of my self-proclaimed wisdom. Listen, um, I want to give you some rules for writing and allow, and then do a little reading to show, or to tell you that how that, uh, those rules of writing went into the writing of this novel. There's a guy called V.S. Naipaul who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, I think, 2002. For a while, he was, also the trustee of an Indian newspaper that I would write for. And once when I was home, I went to the office and I saw a fax above a reporter's desk. And this guy, yes, my Paul, had provided these, this reporter at his request, rules for writing. Many of you who have read George Orwell and the English Times <coughs> found rules that were very similar, but I'm just going to quickly read them. Do not write long sentences. Each sentence should make a clear statement. Do not use big words. Never use words whose meanings you are not sure of. The beginner should avoid using adjectives except those of color, size, and number. Avoid the abstract. Every day, for six months at least, practice in this way. Cool? You can find these, by the way, if you type my name, which is right there, and rules of writing. Okay, so I, with great ambition to improve my writing, quickly took the facts down, and I said I'm going to take this home. And even though I had a PhD by then, and therefore was used to using big words like, I don't know, hegemonic, <laughs> I decided that for the next book, I was just going to follow these rules and only use short words, and only write short sentences. And I wrote a book called Bombay Land in New York, which is entirely based on following these rules. Ooh. All right, since I claimed that I was going to share my wisdom, these rules made me, simply because I followed those rules, made me, or forced me rather, to think about what were my own rules. How did I want to work? And what specially did I want to offer to my students? So there's a simple mantra uh, that I offer my students, which is, write every day and walk every day. Hmm. You don't have to write a lot. Hmm. But write 150 words every day. I keep a small notebook, like, and uh, you know, the other Jeffrey here told me about a book today called The Hand That Feeds You, I wrote it down. And then yesterday I was having dinner after I arrived in Corpus Christi with uh, the husband of a old grad student uh, friend of mine. And he said about having children, he said, you know, I say to them, some days will be good, other days will be better. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, maybe a character thinking he's very witty will one day over lunch say something in one of my books like this. You know what I'm saying? So keep a notebook handy. I teach a year-long course but I just say to my kids, you have to write 150 words every day. Modest goal. But if you do it every day, at the end of this year, you'll have a book. Cool? We have a beautiful campus. Not as beautiful as yours, but... Is this being taped? <laughs> I don't want the president of my college to <laughs> uh, But it's great to walk for 10 minutes, yeah? All right. So what are my goals? What word is my mantra? I'm asking you. You don't want listening, were you? Oh my God! This is the greatest opportunity you had to learn about writing. You're blown it. Anyone who heard it should tweet it out. You know what I'm saying? Write every day and walk every day. 
<laughs> if you write 150 words every day, whatever it is. Huh? Say it again? Yeah, you have a book by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, you, you're in a very boring class, for example. You should, of course, pay attention to what has been said. But um, you could write about what you find boring about it, too. Or you find something exciting to write about it. Something disturbs you. You are sitting having lunch in a cafe and you hear someone say something that's striking you. It's just colorful, different. You write it down. Yeah? All right. Try to write at the same time each day. That's my rule number three. <laughs> Turn off the internet. Just for that time. You know, so for, I've got a little, I've got a little, um, I think it's, I don't know what to call it, timer. Yeah, I just wind it like that, 15 minutes. I think of it as, you know, like gorilla writing. 15 minutes, man, you know, just 15 minutes. Whatever comes in the mind. A bookshelf of your own, by which I mean, I mean, some of you seem look very young, so, you know, like for my seniors, I say to them, whatever project you're doing with me, I want to you to choose four or five books that you think can be most inspiring for you and put it on your desk. For every book that I write, I just put five or six books in front of me. Yeah. All your professors, if you go into Dean DeLeo's office, there are about 12,000 books. <laughs> Hashtag first word problems. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what I need mean is six books. <laughs> I'm providing another austere Gandhian theory. <laughs> Just six books. You know, all right, a bookshelf of your own. So get rid of it if it sounds like grand talk, by which I mean, you know, like those, even all the five paragraph essays that you were taught to write in high school. Oh. The topic sentence is your enemy. <laughs> Don't sound like that. Instead, write freely, you know? Um, so get rid of it. When I start writing a grant application, I never get them anyway, but when I sound it's it's like millions of my brain cells are committing harakiri, right? I can hear them dying in my mind. <laughs> so instead, write free, you know? What would you say? What would you say to, I don't know, your boyfriend or girlfriend about the work that you're thinking of doing? Why do you want to do it? That's that way, you know? I think it's much better. Learn to say no, you know, like, Every few weeks, some call, because I'm so old now, I have so many friends in the profession. Someone will say, "Hey, you want to? Would you mind contributing to an anthology I'm doing?" Or blah, blah, blah. No, no, I don't. I don't mind very much. I cannot. <laughs> I'll write what I'm writing at the moment and finish it. All right. I'm now at my rule nine. Um, finish one thing before taking up another. This is not for you guys so much as much as for the older people. Like you know, when you start your new, when you're young. No, oh, you're laughing, but isn't it? <laughs> you're, if you're working on a project, you're writing a chapter or an article, suddenly, like an inviting light out there, you know, that says, bar still open. <laughs> <laughs> Another project begins to be. You know, you're writing about, I don't know, as opposed as general, but suddenly, hmm, Hemingway is that story. Now I could write an article on that. And suddenly you're in another space. No, man. Finish this, you know? Rule number 10. The above rule needs to be repeated. <laughs> All right, I'll read a little bit, and then shut up. How are we doing in terms of time? You give me five more minutes, but I think. When I was going for my first job talk, not job talk, job interview, I was on an Amtrak train. I took out the notebook and I wrote, the red bottomed monkeys climbed down from the tamarind tree and peeled the oranges left unattended on Lotan Mamaji's balcony. This was a childhood memory. Cool? I didn't do anything with it. Five, six years must have passed. 
I should tell you I must have got the job because I didn't have any time after that to do it. <laughs> Assistant Professor Life Man. All right. Then I wrote a short story from which this first paragraph is. And then I'll read you another paragraph that was written 10 years later. I'm talking of what happened more than two decades ago, my first years here and my first loves. But the reality of my becoming who I am, this evolution, as it, go, as it were, goes back in time to the monkeys that surrounded me as an infant. This is my own personal origin of species. The red-bottomed monkeys of my childhood would leave the branches of the big tamarind tree and peel the oranges left unattended on the balcony of Lotan Mamaji's house. This was in Ara in eastern India in the late 60s. A war with Pakistan was over and another loomed in the future. Prime Minister Nehru had been dead only a few years. In the language of the history books, the nation was in turmoil. Lotan Mamaji was my mother's younger brother, a giant of a man, immense and bearded, palm tucked under one dark cheek like a secret that he didn't want to share. One winter morning, while everyone on the balcony sat listening to the radio, following the cricket commentary from Eden Gardens, a monkey stole into Mamaji's room. He climbed on the huge white bed, and finding Mamaji's pistol, brandished, they said, at my cousin, who was born two months after me, and still in her crib. No one moved. Then, turning the pistol around, the primate brain prompting the opposable thumb to grasp the trigger, the monkey blew his brains out. He was a medium-sized young male. Bits of flesh, bone, hair, and gray matter had to be cleaned from the pictures of the long dead family patriarchs hanging on the wall. Now, I want to tell you, I'll read another paragraph, because I want to tell you that writing is a process. What you have to do is that if something interests you, you have to add things to it. And as I said, it took me years. But I read in the papers some years ago that monkeys were behaving crazily in my in the town where I studied in Delhi. And I met and met a primate. And I said, what's happening? Because the behavior of these monkeys. And she said, oh, you know what happened? This would be described as social fission. Over the years, she said, over the decades after independence, Monkeys, especially male monkeys, in the tens of thousands, were exported to the US. All the research there happened with the monkeys that were sent from here. So that led me into further research. And so I had a scene that I wanted to read to you, just to tell you that nothing happens just in itself. One scene goes looking for another. One argument goes looking for another. And if with a little patience and a little bit of imagination, we have to build it up. So I'll read a couple more paragraphs. <clears throat> so long ago, it seemed, I had told Jennifer about the monkeys on Lotan Mamaji's balcony, the story of the monkey's suicide. It was a story from my infancy in Ara. In later years, of course, I had spun that personal story into a broader narrative. Monkeys as metaphors for migration. The poor monkeys found electrocuted near the Hanuman Mandir in Kanak Place in Delhi had lost their natural habitat. The modern day menace of marauding monkeys, reported by Indian newspapers fond of alliteration, had to do with urban expansion and destruction of forests. That's what I had originally thought. Then came the discovery that another important reason was the massive annual export of young male monkeys right up to the 1980s. The monkeys from Indian forests were living and dying in American labs. This story rescued the monkeys of my childhood from where they were stranded in nostalgia. They were now swinging from branch to branch on the tree of history. One newspaper reported the request made in March 1955 by India's finance minister that senior officials in the United States please explain why the monkeys were needed from India. The Indian government had earlier been told that the monkeys were needed for scientific research on infantile paralysis and for the production of polio vaccines. Was there any reason to doubt this claim? The report doesn't say. 
another account mentions that the Indian Prime Minister Morarji Desai, who interestingly drank his own urine, uh, banned the export of monkeys in 1978. That woke you up, didn't it? Just like, okay, let's pay attention to this guy. Uh, banned the export of monkeys in 1978 because the Americans had violated their promise that the monkeys would be used only for medical research. The side had caused to suspect that they were being put to military use to, defense, to test defense systems and new weaponry. NASA's public records indicate that on June 11, 1948, a V2 Blossom launched into space from White Sands, New Mexico, carried Albert I, a rhesus monkey. I go on about that. It's a little bit like that comedy show where some guy claims, all Indian, all Indian, you know what I'm saying? All right, and I'm ending by saying, um, while reading about them, I told myself that if I had at all been using the monkeys for the biographical purposes, I needed to stop and take note of the fact that they went further than I ever did. An adult monkey has the intelligence of a two-year-old human, and when zipped into its suit, locked in a metal case, its confusion, and if I can use this word, its courage, must have been extraordinary. The NASA site notes that without the use of these animals in the early days of space testing in both USA and USSR, there could have been great loss of human life. These animals performed a service to their respective countries that no human could or would have performed. Was there a link between Indians and monkeys? The Republicans think so. In 2006, a Virginia senator named George Allen called an Indian American youth a macaca. Allen was on the campaign trail, and the team called Makaka was working for his Democratic opponent. At his rally, Allen drew his supporters' attention to the young man. Let's give a welcome to Makaka here. Welcome to America and the real world. Then he began to talk about the war on terror. Thank you so much.